Hello everyone and welcome back to another class of computational thinking. In this class, we will talk about critical thinking as an aspect of computational thinking and the ways that it can uh, lead us to uh, better skills for computational thinking. Here, this is the aim of our class hour. We will distinguish between critical and uncritical thinking and find out how critical thinking can be used in problem solving. And we will have some concepts to learn you will learn about critical thinking, the argument to the best explanation, and the argument from analogy. Okay, let's get started. A starting definition. This is a starting definition for us. Critical thinking is careful thinking directed to a goal. So this is a starting definition for us. I mean, we'll work on this definition and uh, we will uh, try to uh, uh, count more details of this explanation. Here, here are some elements of this explanation. Here are actually some steps for critical thinking. Let's, let me read these one by one. For a, for a thinking to be critical, for a reasoning to be critical, first of all, you have to challenge all assumptions. When you are making some arguments or are reaching a conclusion, you have multiple assumptions. In order to be thinking critically, you should first of all determine those assumptions and challenge them. You should question them and think of possibilities that these assumptions might be false or might not be as strong as you are thinking, uh, them, thinking of them. Second step asks us to suspend judgment. When you suspend judgment, uh, you, you should not jump into conclusions right away. You should just uh, think about other assumptions uh, that you might be making, challenge other assumptions, and reconsider your reasoning and do not jump into conclusions right away. This is what we mean by suspending judgment. Third step tells us to revise conclusion based on new evidence. So this is also part of scientific thinking and scientific thinking also benefits from this element of critical thinking in a sense. Whenever there is new evidence, we should reconsider our judgment, we should reconsider our reasoning in that sense. Fourth step tells us to emphasize data over beliefs. And this is also again part of scientific thinking. Whenever there is data finding evidence, we should use that data, use that evidence over beliefs that are not supported by data, that are not supported by any evidence or observations. Fifth step tells us that there is never ending testing of ideas in critical thinking. You should always test your ideas. Whenever you find new evidence or new data, you, you make new, new uh, ideas, you, make, you come up with new, new ideas, and you should test them with even further newer data again. And you should never stop in, in this process. Sixth step, tells us that one attribute of critical thinking is the perspective that mistakes are data. You should learn from your mistakes. Mistakes are data in that sense. Whenever you make a mistake in your uh, practice, in, in any practice or in any decision or in any judgment that you're making, you should take that mistake as an information, as a data, uh, and you should place it among other data that you're using and inform yourself with, with, you, with your mistakes for your future judgments or future actions. Seventh step tells us, or seventh attribute actually tells us the earnest consideration of possibilities and ideas without always accepting them. You should be sincere with yourself. That's what it means by earnest consideration. You should be sincere that you are not um, abiding by, you're not sticking to your uh, assumptions or your, your beliefs. You should always be testing them. You should always be reconsidering your assumptions and ideas. You should be sincere to yourself. That's the important thing in this step. And the eighth step tells us or eight aspect rather tells us that we should be looking for what others have missed. It's, it's not only our ideas that uh, we are following, we should also look at other ideas and what other people might have missed in their opinions or judgments. These are some suggestions actually for critical thinking. Okay, now let's take an example. You went for fishing on a Sunday, but after two hours, you catch no fish. And like is in the, uh, the guy in this picture, you just happen to catch one shoe from the river. You don't catch anything else. What would be your assumptions? Although I fished here to, all day, I didn't catch any fish because there are no fish in this, in this whole river. This could be one of your assumptions. Again, one of your assumptions could be, although I fished here all day, I didn't catch any fish because there are no fish in this whole river. The second step, tells us to suspend judgment. Do not decide right away. Look for more, more evidence, as the third step says. Now you look for more evidence and see that actually there is fish jumping around in the surface of the river. Now you would have to revise your assumptions based on the new evidence. 
and you could come up with such uh, assumptions like I'll say here now. Although I fished here all day, I didn't catch any fish because the river gods don't like me. This could be one of your assumptions. Another possible assumption. Although I fished here all day, I didn't catch any fish because I was unlucky today. Right? This, this could be another assumption. Another third assumption could be, although I fished here all day, I didn't catch any fish because this is my first time and I don't know how to fish. Now we have to test each idea based on evidence and information. For instance, the first assumption that I just mentioned asks you to assume uh, the river gods. You should test your idea and you should ask, do river gods really exist? Is there anything like a river, actually river god? You should probably test this assumption, depending on the information that you already have. Or uh, how experienced or knowledgeable am I on fishing? Because your third assumption was telling you that you didn't catch any fish because it's your first time and you don't know how to fish. So if, if you if you should test this information and see that you're actually unexperienced and un unknowledgeable, then this assumption actually gains power. There's, a, there's stronger evidence for this assumption. Or you should maybe ask yourself uh, while testing your assumptions, am I standing at the right spot? You should ask such questions to yourself. Maybe you're standing at a spot where, where it's not the path for fish to pass, then you will have to change your location. Right. So um, you might say, I don't care if I'm standing at the right spots in the river or not. I just know that I'm always unlucky. So the reason I haven't caught any fish today is the same. Right. So I'm not lucky in, in my life in general. I, so that's, that's probably why I'm not catching any fish. So here is a quote from uh, Dewey. He says, Immediate acceptance of an idea that suggests itself as a solution to a problem, example, a possible explanation of an event or phenomenon uh, or an action that seems unlikely to produce a desired result is uncritical thinking. This is the opposite of critical thinking. If you say, oh, I've been unlucky all my life and I'm, I don't care if I'm standing at the right spot right now, I don't care if I'm, I, I'm knowledgeable about fishing or not, I'm not catching any fish today just because I'm, I'm just unlucky in my life. If you accept this idea right away, this is, this is an immediate acceptance of an idea that suggests itself as a solution to a problem. This is an instance of that explanation that Divi gives here. And it's, in, it's an instance of uncritical thinking. That shouldn't be uh, your explanation. That's not, a a, that's not an example of critical thinking. Or you can think of another example, again from Dewey. Dewey says, ongoing suspension of judgment in the light of doubt about a possible solution is not critical thinking. Now, again, ongoing suspension of judgment in the light of a doubt about a possible solution is not critical thinking. I can say, I do not know what, ha what happened here, but I'm just not going to think about it any further. I'm tired of thinking about why I'm not catching any fish. I'm just stopping to think about it. So you are susp suspending judgment here, ongoing suspension of judgment. You are not just taking a break from judgment. You're just suspending it forever. This is not critical thinking either, according to Dewey. Dewey is this famous uh, American philosopher who wrote this uh, article about critical thinking. And this is what one of the criteria that he says about uncritical thinking. So here are further uh, elements that Dewey is counting about uncritical thinking. He says, critique uh, driven by dogmatically held political or religious ideology is not critical thinking either. Or derivation of a conclusion from a given data using an algorithm is not, a, again, critical thinking. For the third element here on the screen, I can say I'm 100% sure that the river gods hate me. I mean, pick your crazy version of crazy dogmatic story. Maybe river gods, maybe another story, maybe some genies preventing you from fishing. Uh, so such explanations cannot be critical thinking according to the criterion that Dewey is giving here. Any, any uh, dogmatically held political or religious ideology cannot be critical thinking. You should put any ideology that you're believing in into, uh, into uh, testing, into critical uh, testing. Otherwise, it's uncritical thinking according to the criteria that DV is proposing us. And the last element says, derivation of a conclusion from a given data using an algorithm is not critical thinking either. A good example of this uh, uh, uncritical thinking uh, element will be discussed in the lab session. In, and I will give, be giving the uh, primary elements of that example at the towards the end of today's class. So let, let's uh, wait for it until the end of this class. So let me just go on with my next slide. 
here are some reasons for falling into uncritical thinking. Suspending judgment, no matter how strong the evidence, could be one reason. Reasoning from an unquestioned ideological or religious pers perspective could be another reason. Or routinely using an algorithm to answer a question could be a third reason. As you can see, the third reason might be more related to our purposes in a computational thinking class, but other reasons, as you will see in the example that I will give towards the end of the class, other reasons are also relevant for us. So these are the reasons for uh, uncritical thinking. So um, I will talk about some critical thinking methods, but before that, let me show you some introductory videos about how uh, other people explain what critical thinking is. Let me just make some arrangements here. Critical thinking is all about asking questions. The right questions. Questions that help you assess both the meaning and the significance of claims and arguments. Building these skills and applying them in your life makes it easier for you to assess evidence, evaluate arguments, and adapt your thinking so you stay switched on and engaged in different situations. Critical thinking involves stepping back from a situation to enable you to see all the angles before making judgments or taking decisions. It means identifying the key points, analyzing the sources of information, weighing up different types of evidence, just as a judge and jury would do in a court of law, and putting it all together into your own independent, thought-through point of view. One thing that it's very important to realize is that critical thinking isn't about being critical. And it's about much more than just finding flaws in other people's claims. By itself, that isn't enough to give you an edge. To be a true critical thinker means being creative, reflective, and adaptable, evaluating the evidence to decide for yourself what is accurate, what is relevant, and do I have sufficient information to take a decision on this topic? Thinking critically means taking a stand for yourself. It can be difficult not to be swayed by close family or friends' views on things, or certain beliefs that just feel right. But learning how to use these higher order thinking skills can help you to feel much more confident in your own opinions and conclusions. Critical thinking is also about a sense of discovery and excitement. Not only about learning, but evaluating arguments to see how they stand up. And filtering for yourself what resonates as right or wrong. By using these techniques, you'll find yourself becoming a clearer, better thinker. McCat. One of the uh, videos that I found interesting, and here is another video. Let's watch it together. Critical thinking is a term that gets thrown around a lot. You've probably heard it used often throughout the years, whether it was in school, at work, or in everyday conversation. But when you stop to think about it, just what exactly is critical thinking? And how do you do it? Simply put, it's the act of deliberately analyzing information so that you can make better judgments and decisions. It involves using things like logic, reasoning, and creativity to draw conclusions and generally understand things better. This may sound like a pretty broad definition, and that's because critical thinking is a broad skill that can be applied to so many different situations. You can use it to prepare for a job interview, manage your time better, make decisions about purchasing things, and so much more. Now, as humans, we are constantly thinking. It's something we can't turn off. But not all of it is critical thinking. No one thinks critically 100% of the time. That would be pretty exhausting. Instead, it's an intentional process, something that we consciously use when we're presented with difficult problems or important decisions. In order to become a better critical thinker, it's important to ask questions when you're presented with a problem or a decision before jumping to any conclusions. You can start with simple ones like, what do I currently know? And how do I know this? 
These can help to give you a better idea of what you're working with and, in some cases, simplify more complex issues. Let's take a look at how we can use critical thinking to evaluate online information. Say a friend of yours posts a news article on social media and you're drawn to its headline. If you were to use your everyday automatic thinking, you might accept it as fact and move on. But if you were thinking critically, you would first analyze the available information and ask some questions. What's the source of this article? Is the headline potentially misleading? What are my friend's general beliefs, and do they inform why they might have shared this? After analyzing all of this information, you can draw a conclusion about whether you think the article is trustworthy. Critical thinking has a wide range of applications in the real world. It can help you to make better decisions, become more hireable, and generally help you to better understand the world around you. These were some videos that I thought were helpful to understand what critical thinking is. Critical thinking critical is thinking. all... Now I'd like to talk about some critical thinking methods. And I'll particularly, um, just give me a second. I'll particularly talk about these two methods. I mean, there are multiple critical thinking methods that we can benefit from, but these two methods are useful for our purposes in, in our computational thinking class, and you'll see how they are useful. These will be argument to the best explanation, and another method, argument from analogy. So let me start with the first one, the argument to the best explanation. A, a hypothesis gains inductive support if, when added to our stock of previously accepted beliefs, it enables us to explain something that the observer believe, and no competing explanation works nearly as well. This is a formal definition of the argument of the best, best explanation. So an argument, again, gains support, gains actually inductive support, remember this term from our previous class, uh, when it can explain something that the observer believe and no other explanation works as well as the explanation that we are using. So if one explanation is better than other, other explanations and it can um, um, give sense to what we are observing or, or believing, then we can call such an explanation that this is the argument of the best explanation. Okay, let me just uh, move on to some examples. Here is an example. Look at this picture. You come to your apartment and ob observe that the door is slightly open. Now we will use critical thinking techniques, Techniques, actually the, the one particular method, the argument of the best explanation to find out what's happening here. You come to your door, from this distance, you see that the door is slightly open. As they say, the door is ajar, that's what they say, okay. Here are some possible explanations that you might immediately think about. First one, you forgot to close the door when leaving home this morning. This might be one possible reason. Even when you haven't, you have you had never done it, maybe you woke up early, maybe you were very tired in the morning, and you might think that okay, maybe I just forgot the door, forgot to close the door, and just some wind just opened it even further, and I, I couldn't maybe probably properly close it in the morning. A second reason might be someone with the key got in and forgot to close the door. Maybe you gave your key to one of your parents, to your spouse, or to someone else, to a friend, or to your neighbor. And maybe just they got it and they forgot to close the door and maybe they, maybe they are already inside, okay? A third possible explanation is this. A genie opened the door for you. You came home and, and your favorite genie just opened the door for you. A fourth explanation could be a burglar broke into your house and just didn't go, bother to close the door when they were leaving. A fifth explanation, there was a mistaken police raid on your house. Okay, so let's try to evaluate these uh, explanations one by one. Look at one, look at the first one. Um, so one is not very likely. You just look at, look, at, look, look at the door. You try to imagine your morning. You try to imagine whether you could have forgotten to close the door. And you, you conclude that first explanation is not very likely because you remember closing the door in the morning. You remember the closing sound. You remember that you checked whether you, you pulled it strongly enough or not. So you think that it's not very much likely. You, then you, you consider the second explanation. It's, pro, it's, it's improbable in, in this case, in my example, for instance, because you do not remember having given a key to anyone. You didn't give your key to, to your parents, not to your neighbors, not to your spouse, not to your, your friends, not to your neighbors. So now that you don't remember giving your key to anyone, the second explanation is out of the picture as well. 
So uh, you, you look at the third explanation, it doesn't seem like a meaningful explanation. Genies usually don't open doors for us, so it's, it's far from a meaningful explanation, it's gone. You look at the fourth explanation, a burglar might have broken into my house. It's a possible explanation. You, you take it as a possible explanation. Then you, you look at the fifth explanation. It's also a possible explanation. Maybe there was a mistaken police raid in my house. Maybe the police was looking for someone else. They mistook my house to be their, their house and just they got, in, got into my house by force and they left the door open. Maybe they're still inside. Okay, so fourth and fifth are better explanations than first three because of the reasons that I'm giving in my example. Now you may have to make, as a critical thinking person, you have to make further observations. Upon further observation, you see that the door lock is damaged. You get into your room and you see that your laptop is missing. Now you have further observation, you have further data. At the beginning, you just had uh, this picture. You just, you, you're outside your house, you come, come to your house, the door is open. You think of possible reasons, you immediately eliminate a couple of them and you're left with two explanations. You make further observations and you see that the door is, uh, the door lock is damaged and that your laptop is missing. So you try to think that, okay, probably there has been a burglary in, in this house. The laptop is gone, the door is damaged. There might have been a uh, burglary here. So here's the logical explanation of the situation. First, the observation is your, your lock is broken and your laptop is missing. The explanation is the hypothesis that the house was, has been burglarized combined with previously accepted facts and principles provides a suitably strong explanation of observation one. And a com comparison here, no other hypothesis provides an explanation nearly as good as that in two. And the conclusion is your house was burglarized. Yeah, the other candidate was that there was a, a mistaken police raid. The police got into your house thinking that it was somebody else's house, maybe a criminal's house. But now, now that your, your laptop is missing, this explanation is better than the explanation that tells maybe a police, uh, there was a mistaken police raid in, in your house. So the conclusion is your house was burglarized. This is the conclusion that you reach. So uh, solutions to murder mysteries almost always have the same form of an inference to best explanation. So here is a video from uh, Sherlock, this, this uh, docu-series, sorry, it's, it's just a series, not docu-series. And in, in this, in this uh, small clip that I'll show you, Sherlock, this character, this, this um, uh, detective uses critical thinking methods to solve a mystery. Just let's watch it together and see how the character is Sherlock is using critical thinking skills here. Okay, you've got questions. Yeah, where are we going? Crime scene, next. Who are you, what do you do? What do you think? I'd say private detective. But? But the police don't go to private detectives. I'm a consulting detective. The only one in the world that invented the job. What does that mean? It means when the police are out of their depth, which is always, they consult me. The police don't consult amateurs. When I met you for the first time yesterday, I said Afghanistan or Iraq. You looked surprised. Yes, how did you know? I didn't know. I saw. Your haircut, the way you hold yourself, says military. But your conversation as you entered the room... A bit different from my day. ...said trained at Bart, so army doctor, obvious. Your face is tanned, but no tan above the wrists. You've been abroad, but not sunbathing. Your lips really bad when you walk, but you don't ask for a chair when you stand like you've forgotten about it. So it's at least partly psychosomatic. That says the original circumstances of the injury were traumatic. Wounded in action, then. Wounded in action, Santan, Afghanistan, or Iraq. You said I had a therapist. You've got a psychosomatic limp, of course, you've got a therapist. Then there's your brother. Hmm? Your phone, it's expensive, email enabled MP3 player. Are you looking for a flash? Are you going to waste money on this? It's a gift, then. Scratch is not one. Many over time. It's been in the same pocket as keys and coins. Man sitting next to me wouldn't treat his one luxury item like this. So it's had a previous owner. Next bit's easy, you know it already. 
the engraving. Harry Watson, clearly a family member who's given you his old phone. Not your father, this is a young man's gadget. Could be a cousin, but you're a war hero who can't find a place to live. Unlikely you've got an extended family, certainly not one you're close to. So, brother, it is. Now, Clara, who's Clara? Three cases says there's a romantic attachment at Spence, and the phone says wife, not girlfriend. She must have given it to him recently. This model's only six months old. Marriage in trouble, then. Six months old, he's just given it away. If she'd left him, he would have kept it. People do sentiment, but no, he wanted rid of it. He left her. He gave the phone to you. That says he wants you to stay in touch. You're looking for cheap accommodation, and you're not going to your brother for help. It says you've got problems with him. Maybe you liked his wife. Maybe you don't like his drinking. How can you possibly know about the drinking? Shot in the dark. Good one, though power connection, tiny little scuff marks around the edge of it. Every night he goes to plug it into charge, but his hands are shaking. You never see those marks on a sober man's phone, never see a drunks without them. There you go, you see, you were right. I was right. Right about what? The police don't consult amateurs. That was amazing. You think so? Of course it was. It was extraordinary. It was quite extraordinary. It's not what people normally say. What do people normally say? Okay, so this was uh, from Sherlock, as I said. It's, uh, it's an interesting piece here. And here the character uses critical thinking skills. He compares, he, he uses multiple evidence, he counts multiple observations and evidence and compares them to possible other explanations. He continues to test his ideas, like making further observations and continuously compares those ideas with other possibilities and eliminates other possibilities and comes to the best explanation. And he makes, he benefits from the method that we call argument from uh, best explanation. Go on. Right. So, again, what makes an explanation the best one? I mean, we are calling this method the argument to the best, best explanation. And in, in the uh, burglary example, you, when your house was broken into, you like checked whether the door, door lock was forced or not, whether your laptop was missing or not, and you compared this with other possible explanations. There were five, five other explanations at the beginning, and you thought that your house was broken into. We have some criteria to choose the best explanation among others. Let's talk about these criteria. First of all, the hypothesis should really explain the observations, right? The broken lock uh, can be explained by a burglary, but not by the hypothesis that a friend came to see you, unless you have a strange friend who just comes to see you and breaks the door when they're inside. So that's not a uh, possible explanation. Um, sorry, let me just go back one slide. And the hypothesis of a mistaken pulse rate might explain the block broken luck, but not the missing laptop or the lack of any note or police of, uh, of police officers when you return home, right? So, I mean, the, the, the first reason uh, the, uh, friend explanation doesn't work is because the, the lock was broken, but the broken lock could have explained the mistaken police rate. Police have, might have thought that there's a criminal living in this house and might have broken the door, but then why would your laptop be missing, right? I mean, or regularly we don't think police is uh, like stealing your laptop. Okay, maybe the, lap, the laptop was taken by the police because they wanted to observe some facts about uh, your, your criminal activities if they are convinced that you are still the uh, criminal that they were looking for, then you will need further observation. But otherwise, that explanation would not explain the missing laptop there. Also, there were no police notice. If, if police is breaking into your house, you would either expect the, the police people being inside the house when you come, or a notice that your house was raided by the police and you should come to the uh, police station for uh, giving your uh, testimony, etc. Right. So none of those were there. So probably the best explanation says that uh, the the best explanation that explains the observation is that your house was broken into. Second criteria is that the explanation should be deep. We, we need a deep explanation. An explanation that's not deep, but shallow, uh, when the explanation itself needs to be explained. An explanation is not deep, but shallow when the explanation itself needs to be explained. When you say, use an explanation uh, uh, to, to, to to give an idea about a situation, but that explanation you give needs further explanation, then it's not a deep explanation, okay? It's, it's a shallow explanation. So for instance, why did the police raid your house? Maybe because they suspected you. That explanation is shallow if it immediately leads to another question. Why did they suspect you? Because they had the wrong address? If they did not have the wrong, wrong address, then why would uh, why we would wonder 
then we would wonder why they suspected you. So without an explanation of their uh, suspicions, the police rate hypothesis could not adequately explain the broken luck. The explanation should also be powerful. So it's a mark of excellence in an explanation that the same kind of explanation can be used successfully over a wide range of cases. Many broken locks can be explained by burglaries, right? The explanation should not aim at explaining all possible events. The door was open because a genie opened the door for you and uh, you cannot know why genies do the things that they do. This could be one explanation. You cannot explain why genies do things that they do and the, a genie just explained, opened the door for me. So each, each time you cannot explain an event, you can say that a genie caused this event. So in this case, an explanation is trying to explain all possible events that you cannot explain by observations. Such an explanation is weak because you cannot falsify this explanation. You cannot possibly find proof that the genie did not open the door. An explanation should be falsifiable. There should be conditions that you can count that would, in a hypothesis, falsify the explanation. Take the burglar explanation, for instance. You can say, even before looking at, into your room, if none of my valuables are missing, then probably this explanation of burglary is not a good explanation. You give the conditions under which you can falsify this explanation. But the genie explanation cannot be falsified. How can you falsify a genie explanation by making observations? So that's why the genie explanation is trying to explain all possible events in which you can not give a good observation or you cannot give a good explanation based on observation. Such an explanation is a bad explanation if it's trying to explain everything, right? The explanation should be modest. This is the fifth attribute of a good, uh, uh, this is the fifth criterion of a good uh, argument to the best explanation. The explanation should be modest. The explanation should not aim at explaining more than what's observed. You just come to your house, the door is open, the house was forced and your laptop is missing. This is what you observe. But if you say, when you, find your, uh, when you find your luck broken and the laptop is gone, you, you should not jump to the conclusion that there is a conspiracy against you or the gangs have taken over your neighborhood. Just this bunch of men who is a gang, who, is, who, is, uh, who are members of a gang, have taken over the neighborhood and they have a conspiracy against you personally and that's why they broke into your house and uh, took your laptop. This is not a modest explanation. This is just saying much more than what's observed, right? But that's why that explanation would not be a good explanation either. A sixth criteria, the explanation should fit our well-established beliefs. The door broke open because of a rare chemical reaction in the air molecules around your door lock and your laptop disappeared as a result of weird quantum tunneling. This could be one explanation, right? Again, let me just uh, repeat this weird explanation. The door broke open because of a rare chemical reaction in the air molecules around the, do around the door lock, and your laptop disappeared as a result of weird quantum tunneling. This could be one explanation, but it's not. it doesn't fit our well-established beliefs. Such explanations do not fit our well-established chemical and physical explanations. Your laptops do not disappear as a result of quantum tunneling. It's a very, very rare and interesting and a uh, small phenomenon uh, that doesn't explain the disappearance your, of your laptop. So such an explanation would not fit our criterion of a good explanation. So here we have six explanations that uh, uh, qualify an explanation as a good one. And we can use these criteria to, to find out whether one explanation is better than others. And this compromises, sorry, this comprises the argument to the best explanation, the method for the argument to the best explanation, okay? I will give another example after I explain the second method, argument from analogy. Um, this argument moves from a premise that two, two things are similar in some respect to the conclusion that they must also be analogous in a further respect. Here is the logical formulation of the argument from analogy. One, entity A, has attributes A, B, C, and Z, and entity B has attributes A, B, and C, and we reach the conclusion that therefore entity B probably has attributes Z also. The three dots you see uh, to the left of number three means therefore in logical uh, formalization, it means therefore. So you read the last line as therefore entity B probably has attributes Z as, as well. And you can apply this uh, argument from analogy to multiple examples. Here is one example. 
you are considering whether to buy a whether or not to buy a new model of laptop from a particular brand. This is the new laptop you see in the market or when you're browsing uh, your, your favorite shopping website, you see this laptop. You're considering whether to buy, buy it or not. And you want, you want to benefit from critical thinking methods and in particular argument from analogy. Here is how you can proceed. You know this brand and actually your old laptop was made by this company. You just see a new brand, you, want, you are considering whether to buy it or not. And you just immediately notice that you were attracted to this brand because your, your old laptop also has the same brand. You know that you could easily play most of the popular games on your old laptop. You just, now you're trying to imagine the reasons, the explanations uh, that might lead you either away from or towards buying this new laptop. You're thinking of all the possible reasons. You know that you, you could easily play most of the popular games in your old laptop. You were also quite happy about the speaker quality of your old laptop. You admired your old laptop's colors, which is on the right hand side in this picture. Your old laptop had good battery life and its battery persisted long enough for you. Your old laptop had a keyboard that made you feel quite comfortable while typing. And finally, you used your old laptop for six years without any problems. Now, you want to find out whether this new model will be as reliable and enduring as the old one. Which of these attributes that I've counted should help you make a good decision? Your, your, the question that you're asking yourself is this. Here on the, on the left-hand side in the picture, there's a new laptop. It has the same brand as my old laptop. I counted some attributes of your old laptop and you, you want your, this new laptop to be reliable and enduring. Which of these explanations should be helpful or attributes should be helpful to you to make this decision? This is our question. Okay, here is the, again, logical formulation of this question. Your old laptop has attributes A, B, C, and reliability. And A, B, C are the uh, attributes that I have counted. You like its colors, you like to type with its, its uh, keyboard, you like its speaker quality, you like its battery life, and all the other things that I counted. You can, you can play all the other games, uh, all the uh, popular games with your old laptop, et cetera. I counted all these attributes. They stand for A, B, C in this first line. And it's also reliable, you can rely on your old laptop because it didn't break in all these six years that uh, you used it never failed you even once. The new model has also attributes ABC and conclusion therefore the new model probably is reliable also. This is, this is the uh, formula that you are using to reach this conclusion. So the question that you're asking is this, what should ABC be so that this argument from analogy is strong? For this argument to be strong, you should be able to find attributes in your old laptop that fit your new laptop as well that will imply reliability. So let's go over these uh, examples. What makes an analogy a strong one? First attribute, the cited similar similarities must be relevant. Think of uh, the, the similarities or, or attributes that I counted two slides before. I said, you liked your old laptop's color. The laptop's color or a comfortable keyboard and good speakers are not relevant criteria to determine the reliability or the endurance. You are interested to find whether the new laptop will be reliable or, or enduring, whether it will give a, a good lifetime without failing, without breaking, breaking, right? And I'm not talking about breaking the keyboard. I mean, that might be relevant in that sense if that's what you are looking for. But in my example, you are trying to find out whether the new laptop will be enduring, will endure for long enough without failing. That's what you are looking for. And when you're looking for that uh, uh, attribute, color, speaker quality, and keyboard will not be relevant to your observations, to your investigation, okay? Being able to play most games can be relevant because it shows the CPU strength and that this strength has not dropped significantly in the years on your old laptop. So one of the attributes that I counted in the previous slides was that your old laptop uh, had a good, good uh, uh, has, has a, had a powerful CPU that enabled you to play most of the popular games. That could be one sign of reliability. So that would that could be a, a relevant criteria here. The most relevant similarities are the sameness of manufacturers. I said it's the same brand. The longevity of your old la laptop. I, I mean, you, you one of the attributes that I counted was that you used your old laptop for six years. So that's that's the most relevant one of the most relevant. Uh, similarities 
similarities and whether it lost it, any of its CPU power during its lifetime. So this, this, these are the relevant criteria that you should check and not its color, speaker quality, or, or the comfort, comfort of its keyboard, right? For, for your purpose in this case. The similarities must also be important. The battery life of a computer might or might not be relevant to its reliability and endurance. Many new laptops have acceptable battery lives already. So, I mean, whether you, the battery life of your new laptop is four hours or eight hours might, might be important for other purposes, not, but not whether it's, not, it wouldn't show whether it's reliable and enduring. That's what you're after. You want to use this laptop for long years. You are not interested whether the battery life is long or very short. I mean, very short might be a problem, but whether it's like four hours or six hours, you are not interested. In. And also, moreover, many new laptops, you know, that have good enough for better lives. You don't care whether it's like four hours or six hours or six hours or eight hours in this, in this example. So it might not be important. It might not fulfill the criteria of being important. So the similarity in question has to be more specific. It should not be common in many other similar entities. As I said, many new laptops have long, better lives. If it's similar in many uh, alternatives, it's not an important aspect of this explanation. It doesn't make the analogy a stronger one. Many other laptops have good, better lives. I don't care whether this one has a good, better life or, or a superior, better life. It's not part of reliability for me. On the other hand, if just a few laptop models have good, better life, then this similarity can also be an important one, right? So it, it will depend on the circumstances. But the criterion stays the same. The criterion is that you should find out whether this criterion is important or not. So here is a third criterion for making an analogy a strong one. The relevance of relevant disanalogies can strengthen or, strengthen or weaken the argument from analogy. So here is an example. If I used uh, to play so many games on my old laptop, but I'm not going to play as many games on my new laptop, I just decided that I'm not going to play any more games, then there is a disanalogy. Why am I calling this disanalogy? Because there is no similarity anymore between two laptops. I used to play games in my old laptop, but I'm not going to, I decided that I, I'm bored of games. I'm not going to play any, any more computer games. So it's not an analogy anymore. It's a disanalogy. Moreover, if my old laptop endured so long, even when I used to play so many games on it, then this, this analogy strengthens the argument that the new model will be reliable and enduring. Thinking that playing games heats up the CPU more than other activities on the laptop and has the potential to lower CPU life in the long term. So this, this analogy strengthens the idea that I should buy this new laptop. Do you, do you see there's, there's something interesting going on here? There's, there's not a similarity, there's a unsimilarity, there's a disanalogy. I used to play games in my old laptop, but I'm not going to play games in my new laptop. But this disanalogy might strengthen uh, my reasons for buying the new laptop, okay? On the other hand, assume that the new model only has one color, which is different uh, than my old laptop. Such a disanalogy should not have any effect on my decision. I mean, I don't care whether my old laptop was uh, light blue and the new laptop has only the model which is in, in black. I don't care if this such a disanalogy is uh, relevant for my uh, purchasing decision. It's, a, it's not a relevant disanalogy. So here you find disanalogies and decide whether that disanalogy is relevant or not for making this argument from analogy a strong one or not. This might be a little more difficult criterion compared to the first two. But if you think hard enough, you will understand how it works. And in the coming examples, I will give further applications of this uh, criterion as well. So here's a fourth criterion. The strength of an argument from analogy depends on its conclusions. It depends on its conclusion. For instance, it's better to have stronger evidence for a weaker conclusion than weaker evidence for a stronger conclusion. Here's what I mean. Here's a strong evidence. Many new laptop models are reliable and enduring. And here is a weak, less specific conclusion. This new model is probably reliable and enduring as well. So the strong evidence again is this. I'm just repeating myself, the strong evidence is this. Many new laptop models are reliable and enduring and which this, this idea leads to the, um, 
weak and less specific conclusion that this new model probably is reliable and enduring as well. And here is a uh, weak evidence. My old laptop from the same manufacturer, um, my old laptop from the same manufacturer endured well for six years without much loss in its processor power. This is a weak evidence because why is, it to say, why is this a weak evidence? Because I have just one element for as an evidence, my own old laptop, just one laptop. Why was the previous one a strong evidence? Because I was saying many new laptops are reliable and enduring. I used many observations. That's why it was a strong evidence. But it, strong evidence gave a weak conclusion, less specific conclusion. Now I'm using a weak evidence. My old laptop from the same manufacturer endured well for six years. It's a weak evidence because it's just one observation. And it gives a strong, which means more specific conclusion. This new model is probably as reliable as and enduring as the old model because it's coming from the same manufacturer. It's better to have a weak conclusion because it's more probable to hold, whereas a strong conclusion is less, less probable uh, to come out true. So when you say many new laptops are reliable and in, enduring, you have a strong evidence because you observe many things, but you have a weak, uh, less specific conclusion. You say, you say this new model is probably reliable and enduring as well. When you use a weak evidence, you say my old laptop is uh, reliable and enduring, it endured for six years. It's a weak evidence because you have one observation here, just your old laptop. You have a more specific, more strong conclusion. You say this new laptop is probably reliable and enduring as the old model, but it's not a, uh, it's not a good idea to use the strong conclusion here. It might be counterintuitive for you, but it's less probable that the new laptop will be uh, reliable and enduring if you use the strong conclusion. You want a weaker conclusion, weaker conclusion in the sense that it's less specific. The weaker conclusion was saying, uh, was leaning on the idea that many new laptops are uh, reliable. Let me just simplify this example. I understand that this example might be more difficult than previous examples, but let me simplify it. We've got two explanations. First one says, many new laptops are reliable. Second one says, my old laptop was reliable. Many new laptops are reliable versus my old laptop was reliable. And you are trying to look at these two explanations and find out whether the new laptop that you're trying, this is the new laptop you're trying to buy, is more probably uh, reliable and enduring. More, many new laptops are reliable, just my old laptop was reliable. This one it gives you more probable result because there's more evidence there, right? That's why you need a weaker conclusion that stems from stronger evidence. Again, this exp these explanations are not as easy as the previous example about a burglary in your house, but you think hard, if you think hard enough on this, you will probably understand what I'm uh, trying to get at here. So again, these four are the criteria that make an argument from analogy a strong one. The, the, the uh, uh, analogy should be a relevant, important, there should be relevant disanalogies, and the analogy should depend on uh, the strength of the analogy depends on its conclusion. Okay. So now let me just give you a critical thinking example. And this example, we, in this example, uh, we will benefit from the argument to the best explanation to analyze the example. And in the lab session, you will use uh, the argument from analogy to try to find a solution for this example. So let me just show you these uh, videos. And uh, explain what's happening here. Amazon software engineers recently uncovered a big problem. Their new online recruiting tool did not like women. The glitch, sources told Reuters, stemmed from the fact that Amazon's computer models were trained by observing patterns in resumes of job candidates over a 10-year period, largely from men, in effect teaching themselves that male candidates were preferable. Reuters correspondent Jeffrey Dastin. The technology thought, oh, Amazon doesn't like any resume that has the word women's in it. Women's, you know, captain of a women's chess club, captain of a women's soccer team, and all, some all-women's women's university. Because the company has hired so many male engineers or, or software developers, data scientists, and so forth, 
that clearly the unsuccessful candidates are, are the ones who also would have this, this word women's in it. Amazon never solely relied on these online recruiting tools and disbanded the unit that created it by the start of last year, sources said. It now uses a much watered down version for administrative chores. The company declined to comment. Dastin explaining that artificial intelligence is only as smart as the information it's fed. What people say in the industry is garbage in, garbage out. So if you give it bad data or that reflects some bias or whatever, the computer is just going to mimic that. A growing number of companies are automating recruitment, hoping this will make hiring faster and more uniform. Hilton and Unilever are among those using software made by HireVue, which lets applicants video record answers to employers' questions. Thank you so much. HireVue CEO says his firm analyzes candidates' speech and facial expressions in order to reduce reliance on resumes. Amazon, a source said, has a new team assembled to give online screening another try, this time with a focus on diversity. That was a problem that's, that explains what's happening in Amazon. Amazon. And here is a, another video that explains the same situation. Amazon is learning a tough lesson about artificial intelligence. The company has now abandoned an AI recruiting tool after discovering that the... After discovering that the program was biased against women. Tech expert Ryan Eldridge of Nerds on Call joins me now. And Ryan, this new recruiting engine was supposed to identify candidates that Amazon might hire, but it appears this program chose far more men. Yeah, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out, unfortunately. It's, it was basing its decision on 10,000 different resumes, and it was based on um, what hiring practices Amazon was already doing. So there might have already been some gender bias already in the data that was being put in. But what, what happened was the, the system essentially started discounting any time someone had graduated from a female college or a woman's college or had the word women's in their resume, like uh, captain of the women's chess team, for example. But what they found is that it was also going after specific verbs that men okay. engineers would use in their resume that mm -hmm. women wouldn't, like executed and captured, these really aggressive verbal terms. So even though they could take out and say, okay, well, if you graduated from a woman's college, let's go ahead and ignore that. We're not gonna call that something you need to bias on. It was the other things that mm -hmm. the algorithm was finding to, to suss out the, the, this bias. Yeah, so Ryan, though, the technology is only as good, and the AI technology is only as good as its makers, right? And yet they can't escape the bias of its makers. So this raises a lot of questions about artificial intelligence and its objectivity. It does, you know, and when you think about what we're doing currently, I, I mean, I, I own three different tech companies and we hired hundreds of thousands of people uh, over the course of the last decade. And unfortunately there is bias even in human resource uh, uh, people. Like they may prefer Stanford over Yale or they may pref prefer a certain coding language over another. Um, they certainly are aware and are capable of of, uh, of looking at a resume and saying, well, Angelina, that's probably a woman and maybe I should give her more weight or not. And the problem with humans is we don't always articulate specifically what biases we're putting into our hiring practices, whereas an algorithm actually can tell you specifically why mm -hmm. it has taken this person and said they're less valuable than this other person. A lot of times when it comes to hiring, uh, HR managers are kind of going with their gut or they're going with what they think is best. Whereas really there may be a bunch of unspoken biases about where they live, their gender, or the schools they went to, and, and all kinds of things. Yeah, other things they can factor in. Okay, so Ryan, now that this issue has surfaced, how do the companies like Amazon, Google, how do they tackle this problem? Yeah, so well, with a low unemployment rate, uh, there's not a lot of applicants when you put out a res or when you put out a call for resumes, especially if you're looking in the tech sector where you're looking for very specific skill sets. So what they were trying to do is create a tool that could also not just go through reams of resumes, but could also go out on the internet and find candidates on LinkedIn and other job posting websites. And 55% of human resource managers uh, that were surveyed by careerbuilder.com said they would use some sort of AI system to, mm. to automate their job a little bit. 
And so this is something that's not going to go away. We're all going to start seeing this more and more. And, and it's a little bit frightening to think that there's a computer that's going to decide whether I get the job or not. Right, but places right. Places like Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. and uh, uh, several other companies are already deeply invested in this technology to make their hiring and recruiting more effective. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ryan Eldridge, thanks so much for talking to us. Appreciate it. Okay, so this was the idea. This was what's happening in Amazon. So long story short, Amazon was using a recruiting uh, algorithm, a software, and uh, this algorithm is hiring uh, people whose resumes do not include the word women's or women, like captain of a, a women's chess team or, or a women's volleyball team, etc. Whenever the algorithm sees the word uh, woman or women's, it was just eliminating that candidate. And they, they really couldn't understand why the algorithm was doing this because it wasn't, there wasn't anything in the algorithm that was supposed to do that. And both of the videos explained this situation using the uh, word, using the phrase garbage in, garbage out. So this is, this is the phrase in, you, you must have heard in both of these videos. And the idea is, um, just give me a second for something here. And the idea is um, when you put garbage inside a computer, it gives you out, it gives garbage outside. Remember from our previous class, the stupid computer stone hat. I was feeding the stone head with the valid argument form, and I was telling the stone head that all cats are white. And the stone head told me that Roxy the cat is white as well, and it was a false information. It was a false uh, conclusion that the stone head reached. Because I was feeding computer with false information, even though the algorithm or the logic within the algorithm was, was a valid one, was a correct one, it gave me wrong information. Because I gave him gar garbage, that's why it gave me out garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. That's the idea that both of these videos were uh, using here. So where is the uh, argument to the best, best explanation here? Here it comes. Here is how we can use this uh, uh, our Amazon example, the hiring software example, and use our critical thinking skills to explain what's going on here. Okay, how can we use this, uh, uh, all this that I have taught in this class in computational thinking? Here is the example. Imagine a well-established tech company in the United States named Acme Software Solutions. So I'm, you're not all dealing with Amazon or Google now. We have a new company. It's a big company. It's called Acme Software Solutions. They are looking for a high-level manager. The director of the human resources department is, decides to use a particular software for the recruiting process, for the hiring process. The director knows that once they publicize the job uh, advertisement, there will be hundreds of applicants. Such a number of applicants is way beyond an amount that they can go through one by one. So they want the software to eliminate the types of applicants that do not fit the profile of high-level managers who have occupied similar positions in this company for the last 10 years. So the HR, the head of HR wants to use this software and it wants the software to pick a person for this high-level manager position who resembles the people who held this position in the past 10 years in the same company, okay? This is the idea. They feed the software with the attributes of these past managers. They collect all the resumes and all the information that, that, that they have, the emails and everything they have about these past um, uh, managers of, this, of the same company for the 10 years. They all take all this information and uh, train the computer using some machine learning al algorithm train the computer with this information. And this is how you use machine learning. You don't have to know the details of machine learning to understand this example. You can train computers by data, by means of something called machine learning, and the computer, uh, you, you expect the computer to give you similar results to the data that you fed it with. In this example, you feed the computer with the attributes of high-level managers for the past 10 years, and you expect the computer to look at the new resumes, new CVs, and pick the person who resembles one of the managers in a, in a relevant way, of course. After the company publicizes the ad advertisement, they receive 1,400 applications. They use the software and the software reduces the number of applicants to 100. This is a number that the human re resources department can easily observe. They, will now, cannot, they can now observe the 100 uh, applicants one by one and they don't need the software anymore anymore, they use the software to reduce the big number 1,400 to just 100 applicants. But then something happens. Um, 
before that, before what happens, they want the software to eliminate the types of applicants that do not fit the profile of high-level managers who have occupied similar positions in this company for the past 10 years. This is what they are expecting. They, again, they fit the software with the attributes of these past managers. Um, so I just tried to explain you that they, they fed this uh, in past manager information to the computer. They use some machine learning algorithm. Again, you don't have to understand what's machine learning to understand this example. Machine learning, you just have to know that machine learning is a system uh, by means of which you can uh, give some huge data to a computer and ask it to find similar um, um, elements in the new data that you're presenting it. In this example, you are feeding the data of past managers in this campaign to the machine. The machine uh, uses machine learning algorithm and looks at the new applicants, 1,400 applicants, and tries to find uh, the, the applicant which resembles one of the previous, or not sorry, not one of them, which resembles uh, the attributes of the previous managers, okay? This is what happens here. But one curious employee in the human resources department just goes through all these 100 resumes that the machine reduced to. The machine reduced 1,400 resumes, CVs, to 100. And the human resources department is looking at those um, 100 CVs. One employee in the human resources department just, just notices that none of these 100 applicants is a woman. All of them are men. And they wonder why. What's happening here? So again, I just try to create a situation which resembles the, the case in, in the Amazon, what happened in Amazon in the videos that you have watched. I just slightly changed the example. The computer reduced 1,400 1, CVs to just 100 and the HR department, human resources department will check these 100 CVs one by one, but they notice that all of them are men. All of these 100 people are men. Why did the computer, the machine, reduced 1,400 resumes to 100 and picked only men among these 1,400 people. Here are possible explanations. First one, no woman applied for this position. Second one, some women applied to this position, but none were good enough to be elected by the software for the last 100. Third explanation, the software is a woman hater. Fourth explanation, the programmers who wrote the code for this software are women haters. Fifth explanation, fifth possible explanation. The managers who held this position in the last 10 years were all men. Sixth possible explanation. The women of this particular society are not fit for this job. Seventh possible explanation. Women are not for fit for this managerial, women are not fit for managerial positions in general. Eighth possible explanation. A curious genie meddled with the software, like in, in the burglary case, there's a genie here again. Ninth possible explanation, a hacker team might have hacked the system and changed the results to eliminate all the women candidates. These are all possible. You can even like write further elements to this list. There are, you can just find out all sorts of crazy explanations. So now by using a critical thinking uh, criteria, so for the argument to the best explanation, let me just go multiple slides back to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, when I was talking about argument to the best explanation, I gave you these six uh, criteria for what makes an explanation uh, superior to others, what makes an explanation the best one. An explanation is best, is the best among other explanations, but it fulfills these six criteria better than other explanations fulfill. Okay, so I want you to use this, this, uh, this criteria to ev evaluate all the, all the nine explanations I give for this example that I'm talking about. Okay, you will use these six criteria that you see in the screen. Let me come back to the example. Okay, here is the example. I want you, you to use those six criteria for what makes an explanation the best one, apply all those six criteria to each one of these, apply six criteria for to first explanation, apply six criteria to six, second explanation, apply, et cetera, and see which one is the best explanation, okay? That's how you will find out how this uh, problem can be explained. In general, I mean, this might not be a very difficult example again, but in general, 
you you do such a, a matching you do you would try to match the criteria with the explanations like instantaneously in, in real life cases like in the open door example you just i mean in, but in, in when the example gets more complicated you have to like maybe even write down or or like sit down and think about this process and you have to like apply these criteria to the possible explanations here what i'm giving is a is an exercise but you well, some of these explanations are really simple to see that it's not the best explanation, but think of it as an exercise. I want you to understand how this criteria can be used to all sorts of explanations, okay? After you do that, uh, in, when you were doing that, let me just go back one slide. When you are doing this, when you're applying the criteria to these explanations, you are using the method that I called, I mean, that I taught you, uh, which is called um, argument to the best explanation that will determine what the problem is. In order to solve the problem, you will benefit from argument from analogy. The director of the human resources department now of Acme Software Solutions contacts the manufacturer of this recruiting software and tells them about the problem. Uh, just give me a second. Ed rates running low. So um, the, the director of human resources department of Acme Software Solutions contacts the manufacturer of this recruiting software and tells them about the problem. And the code developers in the software company go through the code and try to fix the problem. They want their software to give the same weight to both male and female candidates and not show bias towards men. These developers benefit from argument from analogy to change the software. Okay, this is the idea here. So first of all, here is the logical description of the problem. First one, first line, past high-level managers had attributes A, B, C, et cetera, and successfulness. Second line, second premise, the new high-level manager also has attributes A, B, C, et cetera. I mean, the same attributes as the first line. Therefore, the, high, the new high-level manager probably will, have, uh, will be successful also. So this is the logical structure and developers are dealing with this question. What should ABC, et cetera, be so that this argument from analogy is strong while it does not show positive bias towards men? And this will be your uh, job in, in the lab session to find out. You'll benefit from arguments from analogy to find out how the developers can improve their software, which, what type of uh, criteria that should, they should use to de develop uh, or what, rather what uh, type of strategies, what are some possible strategies for developers to use to develop their uh, software? And you'll discuss, as I said, these strategies in the lab session. So this finalizes today's class on uh, critical thinking and how we can use some of the critical thinking skills for computational thinking. Thank you for bearing with me and uh, we will see each other in the lab session.